haunted painting. A highly acclaimed artist who painted for royalty descends into madness. An Arctic sailing expedition that ends in tragedy. This is the story of Man Proposes, God Disposes. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or simply welcome if you're new here. My name is Jamie Lee and I'm a mixed media artist. Here on my channel I do time-lapse art videos, light box videos, and art tutorials. I also do a series of what I call weird art videos. These include talking about haunted art, art and true crime, cursed art, and more. I will leave a link to my weird art video playlist above my head if you want to go check them out. Today's art video is a weird art video where I will be talking about the fascinating story of the Edwin Landseer painting, Man Proposes, God Disposes, and how the fact that it may be haunted is just the start of the story. If that sounds interesting and you would like to see more videos like this, please hit that subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified of when I upload new videos. Now before I ramble on anymore, let's get into today's video. Back when I was researching for one of my haunted art videos, I came across more paintings than I was able to include. And I figured I would make a part two where I would talk about some of the other supposedly haunted artworks that I had found. This painting called Man Proposes, God Disposes by Victorian artist Edwin Landseer came up in practically every article I researched regarding haunted paintings. So I figured I would go ahead and include it in this round. However, when I really started looking into it, I realized this was going to be a whole video on its own. There's the story of the haunted painting that hangs in the Royal Holloway Picture Gallery at the University of London. But to understand that, you've got to go back to when the painting was created in 1864, and you learn that Landseer's life was a story in itself. But then, you've got to look at why he painted this particular painting in the first place. And suddenly, we're back in 1845, and the doomed Franklin expedition is getting ready to set sail. And I believe that's where the story really starts. On May 19th, 1845, the HMS Terror, who thinks of these names, that person should be smacked, and the HMS Erebus set sail with 129 men under the command of Sir John Franklin from Greenhithe Harbor on the River Thames, Kent, England. Their mission? To locate the mythical Northwest Passage, a rumored path between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans through Arctic inlets in Canada. The race for discovering the Northwest Passage had been going on for some 400 years, and Britain really wanted to be the ones to discover it, as it would open up a trade route between the United Kingdom and Asia that Britain, one of the world's most formidable countries at the time, knew would secure their spot as a global superpower. As a side note, the Northwest Passage had been the target of expeditions for 400 years, but it wasn't until the 19th century that the possibility of there being a path at all was a reality since the whole area was blocked with ice in the years before that. Hashtag climate change. The Franklin expedition never had even the tiniest doubt that they would succeed, as the phrase the best of the best could truly be applied here. The man who ordered the expedition handpicked Sir John Franklin as the expedition's commander because he was a seasoned naval officer, had traveled numerous times to the Arctic, and well, he was a freaking knight. Later on we'll talk about why he maybe wasn't the best pick, but for now let's go with it. The two ships, the Terror and the Erebus, were considered well equipped for the expedition, as they had been specially ice fortified. In fact, it was boasted at the time that the ships were the most well equipped and technologically advanced in the history of polar expedition. What could possibly go wrong? In addition to the ships being in tip-top shape, they were also stuffed with enough supplies to last up to seven years. This included 32,000 tins of meat and veg, 1,000 pounds of raisins, 580 pounds of pickles, flour, liquor, wine, chocolate, tea, tobacco, soap, candles, lemon juice to fight scurvy, and piles of wolfskin blankets. The ships also carried school supplies and a library so the men could study at sea an organ, and a camera. After leaving England, the ship sailed across the North Atlantic and rounded the southern tip of Greenland. They stopped at Disco Bay on the west coast of Greenland to write letters home, slaughter some fresh beef, and for Franklin to fire five of the crewmates for disorderly conduct and send their butts home.
The ships were also spotted by whalers off the coast of Beachy Bay, right at the opening of the Northwest Passage. It was the last time anyone would see the HMS Terror and Erebus for 150 years. And the last time anyone in the Western world would see the members of the Franklin Expedition alive. It was July of 1845. Sadly, no one even realized the ships were missing for several years. The expedition was planned to last three years, so it was only when the date of return had passed, with no ships in sight, that people began to worry. Sir John Franklin's wife, Lady Jane Franklin, asked the Navy to send out search parties to find her missing husband and crew. Each time a search crew left, Mrs. Franklin sent them with a handwritten letter to give to her husband and a collection of supplies to leave in the tundra in the hopes that he would find them. Lady Jane was convinced her husband was alive. And after the Navy gave up looking for the two ships, after about 40 or so attempts, she used her own money to hire crews to continue looking. Mrs. Franklin? Badass? Well, wait till just a few minutes from now and we'll see that Lady Jane isn't all roses. So let's look at the timeline for a moment. The expedition left in May of 1845 and reached Greenland in July of the same year. The expected time of return would have been about 1848, which is when the search crews started their attempts. It wasn't until 1850, five years after the ships disappeared, that something was found. On uninhabited beachy island past Arctic Bay, Searchers found evidence of a primitive camp, including a crude stone hut, empty tin cans, etc. They also found three gravestones with the date 1846. These were the graves of three crew members from the Franklin Expedition, John Hartnell, John Torrington, and William Brain. In 1854, more information was found, incredibly disturbing information. An explorer by the name of John Ray was also attempting to map out the Northwest Passage and was traveling and living in the Arctic off and on as part of this task. He was also part of several of the official Franklin Expedition search parties. When he came upon an uninhabited island known as King William Island, he found evidence that someone had been there. He met and talked with the native Inuit who lived near Pelly Bay as he spoke their language and had earned the respect of many of the native peoples who lived in the area. And boy, did the Inuits have a story to tell. According to Scotland's The National Newspaper, quote, Inuits also told Ray there were dead white men west of the Black River and sold him artifacts such as silver cutlery, a gold hat band, and buttons which he identified as part of the Franklin expedition, unquote. The Inuits also pointed John Ray toward a pile of human and remains. Ray observed mutilated, emaciated bodies, bones cracked in half and marred with knife marks, and kettles with telltale contents inside. He and the Inuits drew the same logical conclusion. The starving, freezing, disoriented, surviving crew members of the Franklin expedition began to eat the only food source left each other. At the time, Ray wrote, quote, from the mutilated state of many of the bodies and the contents of the kettles, it is evident that our wretched countrymen had been driven to the last dread alternative, cannibalism, as a means of prolonging existence. Ray returned to England and reported his findings, but rather than being lauded for helping solve part of the mystery of the Franklin expedition, he was vilified and discredited by a population of people who were high on their superiority. Their civilized Christian sailors would never resort to something as barbaric and horrifying as cannibalism to survive. The public was outraged and disbelieving, especially once they found out that Ray's information came from unreliable savages, as they they referred to the Inuits. Lady Jane Franklin was furious that Ray would even dare suggest that her husband was involved in anything so base and vulgar and campaigned against Ray publicly. John Ray was an accomplished, intelligent, and respected explorer until this public dressing down he received and his reputation never quite recovered. Once it was known that Franklin was indeed dead, Lady Jane seemed to have some sort of stake in becoming
becoming a hero's widow. According to the hyperallergic article, the grisly and heroic propaganda of the doomed Franklin expedition. And again, according to the National, quote, in 1857, Lady Franklin sent out another expedition led by Francis Leopold McClintock. He found written proof of Franklin's death and the locations of the ships which had been abandoned by the crew. The written proof was discovered in 1859. A sealed tin can under a stone cairn on King William Island contained an official sheet of paper from the expedition with two handwritten updates, one from May 1847 and another from April 1848. May 1847. The ships were icebound, but all was well. The update one year later was much more grim. April 1848. The two ships had been stuck in ice for more than a year. 24 crewmen had died. Sir John Franklin, their leader and commander, had died on June 11, 1847. Crozier, the captain of the Terror, took over command and planned a journey on foot with the remaining 105 survivors pushing a boat and heading toward the Great Fish River, hoping they could sail across and get help. Sadly, they all died. This party were the ones who resorted to cannibalism, according to Inuit accounts. It seems like the tale of the Franklin expedition is another example of history being rewritten as it happened to suit whatever narrative was beneficial to those in power. Namely, that the British remained seen as a superior world power and as the leading Arctic explorers. Unfortunately, that version just wasn't true. While higher-ups were writing Sir Franklin into the history books as a hero and the discoverer of the Northwest Passage, many accounts actually paint him as an inept captain who had bumbled a previous mission, causing the deaths of members of his crew. His widow was campaigning for her place in history and as a darling of British society. And the actual men, who had done most of the dirty work of finding out the real story, were soundly dismissed because it wasn't the story Britain wanted to hear. After Ray's update and what the search parties had discovered as physical evidence, almost 150 years would pass before new information was discovered about the fate of the Terror and the Erebus. First, over a century later, in the 1990s, the cannibalism claim was proved true when skeletons of 11 dead crew members were found with saw marks on the bones. And remember those three graves on Beachy Island? The bodies of the three crewmen who were buried there were exhumed and studied in the early 1980s, and the preservation of the bodies in the Arctic permafrost was a surprise even to the researchers. They were still almost completely intact, although one had had an autopsy performed on him, likely because the expedition's doctor or the ship's higher-ups were puzzled as to why men were dying so soon into the journey. Although there still isn't a perfect agreement on what actually caused the men to die, most agree that a combination of the following led to the demise of all 129 men. Elevated levels of lead, either environmental or some leaking into their meat and vegetables from the tinned food, tuberculosis and pneumonia, and exposure or starvation. Extensive testing was done on the three corpses that were found and like fingernails and pieces of their hair were taken so that they could take those to the lab and find out you know what was going on that these men had died but then the three crewmen were reburied in their same grave locations the ships were finally found after 150 years of searching by canadian expeditions in 2014 and 2016 but not where they were known to have become stuck in the ice in 1848 both ships were found sunk off the northwest coast of king william island a fair distance from beachy island inuits had said at the time that some members of the expedition returned to the ships and sailed south, and the location of the ships when they were found sunk seems to confirm this. The Terror and the Erebus are still being explored, and many people are hoping for some well-preserved evidence, hoping that these ships lost in time have a tale to tell. Ten years after John Ray unleashed the awful truth onto British society, a truth no one wanted to believe, a man named Edwin Landseer enters the story. Landseer was an artist, a very renowned and respected artist, known for his realistic and popular animal and pet paintings. For some reason, 
1864, Landseer decided to make a painting showing his idea of what happened to the doomed Franklin expedition. His painting was known as Man Proposes, God Disposes. It shows two polar bears in an Arctic landscape at the site of a shipwreck, either the Terror or the Erebus. One bear is ripping apart some blood-stained fabric, while the other is munching on a human rib bone, with a rib cage visible in front of him. Not exactly a painting to capture the admiration of polite British society, but it did capture the attention of one man, and that was good enough. The man was wealthy Thomas Holloway, who together with his wife founded a school of higher learning for women in 1886. In his search for suitable artwork to display at the school, Royal Holloway, which became part of the University of London in 1900, he couldn't live without Man Proposes, God Disposes. He purchased it at Christie's auction for a price of £6,615, the most money ever paid at auction at that time for a work by a living artist. It was displayed in the college's picture gallery and hung there for many years before becoming the subject of an odd and frightening rumor. But before we get to that, it's worth it to talk a few minutes about the artist of this painting, Edwin Landseer. For his story among this bigger strange tale is also incredibly interesting and tragic. Edwin Henry Landseer was born in London in 1802. He was the youngest of seven and his father was an engraver and several of his brothers became engravers too, which as we'll see helped Edwin later in his career. His father greatly encouraged Edwin's art and Landseer became known in his lifetime as the greatest British animal painter of the 19th century. It even became a status symbol to have your pet painted by Landseer. In fact, during his life it was so common to see a Landseer work in British households that if you didn't see one it was considered odd or assumed that that family must be very poor. Because his brothers had engraving businesses, Edwin was able to easily make and sell prints of his popular paintings. Landseer was very gifted at a young age. He was awarded a drawing prize at age 11 and learned both watercolor and oil painting at age 12. He had two oils hung in the Royal Academy exhibition at age 13. He was 15 in 1816 when he began attending the Royal Academy School where he studied animal anatomy to help his paintings, as in dissecting. As a young adult, he traveled and painted and made fans ranging from Sir Walter Scott to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. In fact, he was so well liked by Victoria and Albert that he stayed with them at Balmoral, was knighted, and taught them etching. Then, suddenly, it all fell apart. Most people say that Landseer's troubles began when he was commissioned by Victoria and Albert to create a large family portrait, a commission he accepted but never completed. It was said that his inability to complete this portrait began his downfall. He had a mental breakdown over not finishing the painting and became extremely depressed, a condition that would haunt him for the rest of his life. Possibly adding to the breakdown was the refusal of his marriage proposal by the Duchess of Bedford. In everything I looked at, it was pretty much universal that Landseer's mental troubles and the failed commission happened around the same time. It's a chicken and egg question for me, honestly. Did the commission cause a mental stress that he never recovered from? Or did he have some mental issues for a while that he was able to deal with, but the failed painting just pushed him over the edge? It is a question that we will not be able to answer, but I thought was interesting to mention, since we are becoming much more open about mental health now, and this happened at a time when mental illness was not at all understood or supported, as we'll see in a minute. Landseer's self-image took a big hit too, and he even turned down an offer in 1866 to become president of the Royal Academy because he thought he didn't deserve it. In addition to depression, he saw his health decline and he turned to drugs and alcohol. His mental health suffered more greatly and he began to shut himself inside and had to be looked after by family. He still painted and even completed one of his greatest achievements, the lions at Trafalgar Square. In 1872, family members had him officially declared insane and a year later he died on October 1st 1873. As a testament to how much he was appreciated by England, when he died people lowered their blinds 
Flags flew at half-mast. Large crowds gathered to watch the funeral procession. It was a national mourning. Sadly, one of Victorian England's most beloved and talented artists ended his life sad and feeling like his body and mind had let him down while battling mental demons that eventually consumed him. But did those demons, or demons of a different kind, take up residence in one of his paintings? Specifically, the work he created in 1864 named Man Proposes, God Disposes? Are the rumors surrounding the painting even today a ghostly mystery? Or just college kids having fun with a believable urban legend? Let's take a look at how this gruesome painting by a brilliant but mentally ill painter about a tragically doomed Arctic expedition supposedly turned out haunted. Remember how Thomas Holloway acquired the polar bear painting at auction for his collection to display at his new school? Well, in all he purchased 77 paintings. They were all hung in the picture gallery, a large hall that later became the only building on campus big enough to house all the students while they took their exams. So now we fast forward to the 1970s or 80s. The stories differ as to when this incident took place. As with most urban legends, you can't really pin it down. When one particular group of students was sitting for exams, one student was placed next to the Landseer painting. During the exam, he was so disturbed by the painting that he went to the proctor and said if the painting didn't get covered up, he would not be able to complete his exam. The proctor was at a loss as to what to cover this rather large framed painting with, so he or she grabbed the biggest thing they could find, the Union Jack and covered the painting. This began a tradition that is still observed to this day. At the Royal Holloway Picture Gallery at the University of London, the man proposes God disposes painting is covered with the Union Jack at the beginning of exams. A former University of London student wrote on Reddit that the painting and the sinister story surrounding it is mentioned by tour guides giving college tours. And why is that? It's not just because the painting made a student feel uncomfortable during exams. It's because the painting allegedly made one student so uncomfortable that he or she left their exam unfinished, left the hall in a disturbed state, and took their own life. Later, when the proctor went to collect the student's abandoned exam paper, the only thing written on it was, the polar bears made me do it. Great story, right? What a fantastically spooky college urban legend. The only problem is there's absolutely no evidence to support the suicide story, but it's told by tour guides, students. The painting is covered each exam season. The story has spread far and wide in internet haunted painting compilations. And yet, no one knows if the legend is actually true. Maybe it's just another creepy piece of the puzzle that was started way back in 1845, when two ships left the harbor on an ill-fated voyage that involved tragedy after tragedy that spread across 150 years of history, which Leads us to the question, was the voyage cursed from the start? Why did Landseer's life take a nosedive soon after creating a painting about the Franklin expedition? Why has the painting been plagued by rumors and reports and a people feeling disturbed by it to this day? Despite all we now know, the answers to some of those questions may always remain a mystery. And that is the tale of the haunted polar bear painting, Man Proposes, God Disposes. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like or comment. Hit that subscribe if you want more videos like this one, and ring the bell to be notified when I post new content. Also, if you have a suggestion for something you'd like me to cover, please leave a comment below. And as always, thank you for spending your time listening to this story, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye! Okay. 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 Who thinks of these names? That person should... That person should be... That person... Oh my god. <coughs> and learned both... Before... As a superior war...